This is the Plagman Rules Podcast. All right, everybody, the weekend's over. It's time to get back at it. And on today's edition of the Plagman Rules Podcast, it's Monday, July 24th. Two things we're going to talk about today. Number one, the weekend box office. We're going to take a look at how things did over the weekend. And of course, we're going to talk about Comic-Con. We're going to talk about what was a Comic-Con, a couple of things that weren't at Comic-Con, what stole Comic-Con, what was the best thing, but we're mainly going to focus on DC and Marvel stuff, because I know that's what everybody wants to hear about, so we'll go ahead and we'll talk about mainly those topics today. Okay, so uh, first of all, we've got the weekend box office here. Dunkirk is your winner for the weekend box office. Not too surprising. I put it at getting about 51 million. Again, you can check these box office numbers that I'm predicting at movieblogger.com, Plagman Rules on there. You can see all the weekend box office predictions, and I also post reviews there. I put Dunkirk at 51 million. It came in at 50.5, so that's very close. And uh, Expectations had it pretty close to that, about 55 million. I did not think it was going to get that high. Number one, because it was Comic-Con weekend. We saw a very similar thing happen same time last year with Star Trek Beyond, which really, I think, suffered from opening at Comic-Con. If it had opened, you know, a week earlier or later, depending on the competition and stuff, it maybe could have gotten 60, 65 million opening weekend. And so with Dunkirk, I'm thinking, yeah, it probably could have gotten like maybe 53, 54 million. I don't think the numbers were actually going to be that low because sure, there's a lot of crossover appeal between the comic book nuts, mainly because of Christopher Nolan's name in the title and everything, and war movie freaks, you know, because those two audiences don't always cross over. That's something to consider there. Also, I think the movie is probably going to hold a little bit better than some of the big recent tentpole films we've seen like Spider-Man Homecoming and War for the Planet of the Apes have now both and their second weekends dropped more than 60%. So we'll maybe see a bit of a better hangover, if you will, for the, for Dunkirk. Maybe that one's going to fetch like 30 million next weekend or drop maybe a little under 50. It's going to have some competition with Atomic Blonde for the same crossover action audience, Girls Trip, the big winner this weekend. Now, sure, Tracking had put Girls Trip at like 27 million. I didn't believe it for a second. I mean, comedies have been doing so poorly this summer. Just awful. I mean, The House is still a gigantic flop. The other kind of bridesmaid wannabe film, Rough Night, really tanked as well. It's just not been a great summer for comedies, unless you're like The Big Sick, which was kind of a smaller movie. Or if you consider it Baby Driver, which was kind of more of an action comedy. That's doing really well. The Big Sick, especially for being a limited film, is doing really well. But now with Girls Trip, we finally have a solid hit for comedy films this summer. 30.3 million opening weekend. Now, yeah, I was really lowballing this. I think I put it at 16 and a half, so it almost doubled my poor, you know, below tracking expectations. So, yeah, that's kind of a thing to consider there. Plus, $19 million production budget, which means they probably cost them probably closer to like 45 or 50 million after marketing. Yeah, they're going to have no problem with this thing breaking even. Next thing we're going to talk about, down in fifth place, Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. Now, a lot of people are saying this is going to be the biggest bomb of the summer. But here's the thing you have to remember. The production budget, at least right now, when it's equated over because it was in francs or something and now it's over in dollars, at about 210, 210 million. And it only opened to 17 million here in the States. Now, I checked, as far as I'm seeing, none of the foreign markets are reporting in. So either I got it wrong to where it's not opening in those foreign markets this weekend and it's waiting later, or they're not reported in yet. Either way... It's only at 17 million so far worldwide. It opened in a couple other countries, but those numbers have been very low. I'm kind of shocked. Now, I'm not shocked at the domestic total because domestically speaking, I think I put it at 19 million. So it's just a little bit below expectations. Tracking had it at 18.5. So that's overall, it's almost hitting the mark of where everybody thought it would be. And in my opinion, that does not automatically make it a bomb. Plus, we have to consider of that 210 million, I've heard various reports, but approximately half or a little under half of that came from Luc Besson, the director's bank account, directly. So not all of the money that was put up to make the movie came from the studio directly. But at the same time, this is from STX and Europa, it's going to bite them on the ass because I'm sure Besson's numbers and his quotes and stuff for what comes in as the grosses, a lot of that I'm sure is going to go back to just so he can cover his own ass with all the money he put down for the movie. So, and at least that's just off of this domestic opening weekend. Yeah, it's going to be a huge bath 
for the studios. And it might even, I hate to say it, but Europa has not been doing extremely well here in the States lately. Overseas, they've been doing better. But another couple of these, and that studio is going to tank. But still, yeah, we'll see what happens with the foreign market. Again, from what I'm seeing here, it's not opened up yet. Either I had that information wrong or they're just not reported in yet. But we'll figure out and we'll I'll check on this like every week or so, probably till mid-August or late August, and we'll see how it looks. But for right now, I'm saying don't press the panic button yet, but make sure you have your finger right by it just in case because $20 million would have been above expectations for them. 25 million would have been great. 30 million would have been bonkers. Good. But 17 million, it comes in true, below expectations, but it's not like if it had opened to like 12 million, then you're pressing the panic button. It had opened to 10 million, yeah, that's when you fire people. 15 million even would have been bad, but 17, it's not going to be the, it's not the worst thing in the world. Even if the movie makes like 50 million here in the states, as long as those foreign markets go out to see it and as long as it makes good bank overseas, they'll do all right or they won't lose as much as everybody says they will. So, yeah, if you're reading any reports or anybody else going out there saying all this stuff about this being the biggest bomb of the summer, let's just hold off on that a minute. And they might be right. I might be totally wrong on this. But for right now, I'm saying don't press the panic button yet. Okay, a couple other ones we'll talk about here. Spider-Man Homecoming, I should have seen this coming. But in my predictions, I put it at number four, and, and War for the Planet of the Apes I thought would do better than this. Spider-Man Homecoming in the daily markets, like on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the weekdays, was actually doing better than War for the Planet of the Apes almost every time. Most of the time that equates to being on top of the other film next weekend at the box office, most of the time. So why I didn't see that coming is on me. But $22 million for its third weekend, it fell an even 50% from last week. It has now cleared $250 million here in the States, and now worldwide is coming very close to $575 million. Now, yeah, I think that's off of a $175 million production budget. That's a really great result. It definitely shows that there's still interest to go and see Spider-Man. It also added in the fact of all the great critical reviews also shows that, yeah, this thing is going to have legs. Probably we're talking close to 275, maybe knocking on the $300 million door here in the States, and probably closer to 700 or 750 million worldwide when everything's said and done. Not so great, though, for War for the Planet of the Apes, falling 63% its second weekend, even though it had almost 80 more theaters it was playing in, and even though it had really great reviews. But I kind of alluded to this last week and in my review last week, and that was that the movie is probably not going to have all that great a rewatchability factor. Because it is, at times, kind of a dark, depressing movie. And it is a war movie, and there's a POW aspect to it that doesn't exactly scream, I want to see this five times in the theater. It's just under $100 million now in the States. After worldwide total, it's now close, very close. Like, within probably a couple hundred thousand dollars of $175 million. Thing is, it costs $150 million. Now, the foreign markets, it hasn't opened in every foreign market yet. There's still a couple key markets it hasn't opened yet. So we're probably talking somewhere in the neighborhood of $450 million tops here, and that's if the other foreign markets really come in strong. If not, we're talking maybe $300, $350 million, which for Fox is not a huge sign that everybody is clamoring for more Apes films. Okay, so I guess that's all I got for the weekend box office there. We're going to move on now to the Comic-Con stuff. And here's the main thing. We're just going to talk mainly DC and Marvel because that's what everybody wants to hear. That's what everybody wants to know. Between the two, who won Comic-Con? Who comes out on top? Who started at a lower low and has come to a higher high between the two dueling studios? And I'll tell you what, I got to be honest here, even though I have not been a gigantic fan of DC so far. Wonder Woman has made them one for four with their comic book movies in the DCEU. I think DC brought a lot of thunder to Comic-Con, and I think a lot of it stuck. First of all, we got the Justice League poster, which is all right. I mean, it's a good poster. It's not a terrible poster. Then we got, again, it's not a trailer, in my opinion. It's a lot of footage, and they, they kind of specified it as Comic-Con footage. It's like four and a half minutes long. No, that's not a trailer. Maybe in the old days, like back in 1960, they had a four-minute trailer, but no, that's special footage or extended footage or whatever. But what I saw of it, I really liked. I have to admit that. Well, first of all, the color schemes are a lot better. 
it doesn't look like they're going to put gray on black on gray on black, you know, like Man of Steel arguably did, and to some degree Batman v Superman did. Seeing Wonder Woman back in action is cool. I'm interested to see what they do with Aquaman and how he's going to factor into things. Interesting to see a better look at Ezra Miller's Flash because Batman v Superman was kind of like, you can't get a good read on that. And the same goes with Cyborg. I want to see what happens there too with those. It was really fun to see the back and forths between Alfred and Bruce Wayne. Well, kind of, sort of. You know, a few of his lines were really good. Nice to see, like, the bank sequence at the beginning with Wonder Woman kicking ass again. Like I said, that's that was pretty pretty fun to watch. They could really bring this together and make this a really great movie and, you know, make sure that their DCEU is off to a really kind of second start here. And so far, everything looks all right. Then Aquaman, they showed some footage there. It's just early footage. You know, they only started shooting a few months ago. So they don't have anything ready to go for like a big trailer or anything like that. The movie is like 17 months out or so, pretty close to 17 months. So it's not like they're rushed or anything. And so, yeah, I'm not worried that they're not putting any footage online. I know some people were getting all pissy, but that's people. Okay, so then we get a little bit of news on the Flash movie, and now it's going to be Flashpoint, or inspired by Flashpoint. Now, yeah, I'm, I'm going to admit right up front, I don't know exactly 100% what Flashpoint is, but from what I've heard from everybody, it's basically like a start over thing, like the equivalent of what X-Men Days of Future Past was to the X-Men. This is what Flashpoint is could be to the DCEU to where maybe if there's something they want to correct or something they want to fix, that can do it. Then we got a little bit of a non-story, but Wonder Woman, the sequel, is actually going to be Wonder Woman 2, and that's Roman numeral 2, kind of kicking back to the Superman 2, and that was Roman numeral 2. That sounds like the stupidest thing to bring up, but I that's awesome. I love that. But the biggest story, the biggest story that came out from DC by far was, again, we're having the struggle with what's Ben Affleck going to do with the future of Batman. Is he going to be in anything past Justice League at all? Is he going to do the Batman and then call it quits? Or is he going to keep going as Batman past the standalone movie? And, you know, initially Hollywood Reporter came out with this stuff on Friday. So right before they got on the stage on Saturday, they had this thing dropped. Right after I got done with the show on Friday, this dropped. So I didn't have time to bring it up then. Ah, man, I don't know what to say about this. Ben Affleck, yeah, I'm on everybody's side who says, yeah, that Batman v Superman is almost an irredeemable film if you take Ben Affleck out, because his portrayal as Batman was really good. And again, kind of like what I say about Henry Cavill, put him in a better movie, and I think he can be a great Superman. Same goes with Batman. Yeah, to see him kind of take off in a way and have the struggle going on, it's really too bad, because again, He could really make a big impact as Batman, but first of all, he lost the thing of directing it. That was back in February. Then he lost the script. Now he might just drop out entirely. So all the pieces are kind of slowly coming off the plane here, and this is either going to equal into a crash or a miraculous landing. I don't know which of the two, but... This is going to be something we're going to watch very closely here over the next couple of months. We'll see if Ben Affleck gives any more clues as to whether or not he's staying on. We'll see if Warner Brothers can dodge anything. But the initial reports from The Hollywood Reporter says that they were trying to get an exit plan. So we'll see if that exit plan, if there's anything in Justice League that pops up. And then a lot of things, too, that people said that might back that up. And I'll kind of leave this on a final note here. Remember, Joss Whedon did some reshoots here recently. Initially, everybody thought, oh, he's doing reshoots because Wonder Woman did so well, and now they want to put more Wonder Woman in it. What if it was Ben Affleck stuff that he was reshooting? What if it was, okay, this is now, we're making changes, so now this happens to Batman, and now the future of Batman is going to be in question. What if that's what the reshoots were for, or what a good portion of them were for? Who knows? We'll have to wait till November to find out. Okay, now we're going to switch gears. Let's go over to some Marvel news. Now, I think Marvel, at least from what I've heard, because of course they only released the Thor Ragnarok trailer so that everybody could see it, but they also had Black Panther footage. They had footage from Ant-Man and the Wasp. And of course they showed that thing from Infinity War again that they showed at D23 the week before. So as far as footage goes, yeah, it's probably going to be Marvel who won. But as far as news and significant stuff, 
it's DC. So there you go. They tied. <laughs> I know, just to be political and to give those kind of answers. But anyways, so the Captain Marvel stuff, let's start with that, actually, because they didn't have any footage. They haven't started shooting yet, so that's no worry. Again, it's not coming out for more than a year. We're talking closer to two years. But we got word not too long ago that Samuel L. Jackson was going to come back as Nick Fury. And now we see why, because this is set in the 90s. And so that means we're getting a Nick Fury that does not have the eye patch yet. That's a cool idea. But then at the same time, I was kind of thinking that, and I was like, well, hang on a minute. 90s, so that means it's set before the first Iron Man, which kickstarted this whole thing. Hmm, what other movie recently has had a female superhero set before the first movie in their cinematic universe? Hmm, I'm totally lost here. Now, who knows? Maybe that was just the idea to begin with when they started writing the script, probably a year or two years ago, whatever it was. But I wouldn't be shocked if we hear down the road that, yeah, we kind of just stole that out of Wonder Woman's page. You know what? But if it works, it works. And the thing is, if you say that, well, Captain America, the first Avenger did that too. And arguably Wonder Woman took that out of Captain America's book. So (laughs) I don't know. Everybody steals from everybody in this industry. And then another thing too, that was really cool to learn about was the scrolls are going to be the villain here. Yeah, so I'm excited because I thought the scrolls would come in at some point or another, but I was thinking more like the fifth or sixth Avengers movie, like after you get to the end of Thanos and after you solve the whole Infinity thing. But I was thinking the scrolls they would save for later, but no, they're going to be kind of the big enemy for Captain Marvel. All right, I'm down for that. Plus it's Brie Larson and she's phenomenal. And it looks like there's a lot of fun stuff going on here. It's kind of interesting to hear about all this stuff, and it makes me really curious to see what this is going to look like, too. Okay, yeah, so then the next thing, of course, is going to be Thor Ragnarok, the second trailer. And while I really, really like this second trailer, I don't know, I think maybe that teaser trailer got me just a bit more pumped for what the movie's going to be, because that kind of gave me a little bit more of a sense of what it is. Now we get kind of some more add-ons here, like more scenes of him and Banner together were great. The thing of him and Loki together, they're brief, but it looks like that's going to be fun. I really like the idea of them teaming up to take down Hela and all them coming together. That looks pretty cool. And yeah, I think overall I was very impressed by this second trailer, even if I'm probably going to remember that teaser trailer a little bit more. Okay, nothing really to bring up about the Infinity War thing. We didn't learn anything additional. They just screened the footage again, and they had a few of the cast members out. So, yep, that's kind of the same thing. But yeah, again, just from the sounds of it, that footage sounds crazy. Okay, so the next thing would be Ant-Man and the Wasp. We got a couple of really neat details here. First of all, Lawrence Fishburne's in the movie. Really cool to hear he's announced. He's a great actor. And then we get the announcement that they have cast the wife of Hank Pym, and that's Janet Van Dyne, and that is Michelle Pfeiffer. Good casting. And really cool, too, was we got to see Michael Keaton kind of turn and go from the hero Batman to now the villain Vulture. Now, what I really wish, it's like 99% not going to happen. But if there is a way they can get Michelle Pfeiffer on screen as the Wasp or the former Wasp or whatever, and a scene of Vulture, (laughs) that would be swapping the hero and villain role from Batman Returns. That would be terrific. I know, again, it's not going to happen, but oh well. Plus, they had some footage that they showed again. They just showed it for the people at Comic-Con. That's pretty much all. The only other thing, Hannah John Kamen is playing Ghost who I guess is a villain in Marvel that I I don't know anything about. Okay, so the last thing they showed for Marvel was some Black Panther footage. They showed some clips. They got some stuff that basically is going to be probably thrown together into a new trailer here in the next couple months. Again, we'll probably see it in a couple months, so don't worry about it, all you people who weren't there, weren't able to see it. But we also learned that it's set like slightly after Civil War, the events of Captain America Civil War, which means, yeah, we're probably not going to get too many flashbacks. We're probably just going to focus on that. We might even get some clues as to what's going to happen with Winter Soldier. That could be really cool. Now, we don't know for sure if Sebastian Stan is officially in the cast, but it'd be really cool if he even showed up for even a post credit scene where we kind of get a little preview of what he's going to do, because we know he's going to be in Infinity War. Okay, so that's everything with DC and Marvel. Now, yeah, we kind of, I kind of mentioned it earlier, but yeah, I think 
in a way, they both kind of won, you know? Marvel won with the footage stuff, because everybody went crazy for the Infinity War footage. Everybody went crazy to see Black Panther stuff. But as far as actual newsworthy stuff and things to mention, yeah, I think we're definitely going to give that one to DC. Now, one thing I'll quickly mention here before I mention what was my absolute favorite thing out of Comic-Con that I was able to see, I'll mention Fox. You know, we kind of got the news, we talked about it last time about Doctor Doom movie, which I don't know if that's a great idea, but they did not show anything from their upcoming projects. They did not show anything from Deadpool 2, even though they've been shooting that for a while. They're just starting production on X-Men Dark Phoenix, so... They probably wouldn't have anything to show for that. New Mutants started shooting not too long ago, so again, probably not way too much footage on that. But here's the thing, you know, everybody gets pissed off because they don't have anything on that, but you have to think about it. If these guys are doing their jobs right, they're working hard on the movie, which means maybe they don't have time to come to Comic-Con. They don't have time to take a week off or part of a week off, whatever it is, because it's going to take more than just one day for them to get there and to have everything set up and every everything goes into it. It's a big process. Maybe they don't have that time to take off. I mean, after all, because especially something like New Mutants that's coming out in less than nine months, and they just went and started shooting not too long ago. Dark Phoenix probably will have a lot of special effects work that's going to be taking a lot of time there. And Deadpool 2, less than 12 months. That's coming out toward the beginning of June. So yeah, they're probably busy at work. Maybe that's why they're not there, because they're actually working on stuff that you're going to pay to see later, all you people who are complaining. Anyway, so I know, that's I've talked about how everybody else is complaining, but anyways. Yeah, I mean, sure, it would have been cool to see some panels on Deadpool 2. Would have been great to see Ryan Reynolds come back up and talk about what he's, you know, how things have changed and what's going into this sequel that wasn't in the first and all that. Sure, all that's really fun to read about, but hopefully, yeah, it's just a sign of not them being not confident with what they're doing, but just them saying, well, we're just working hard on it and we don't have time for everybody to take off. That's hopefully what's going on here. But here's the thing. Here's what stole Comic-Con for me. The thing that I'm going to remember as my favorite part of Comic-Con. And it's funny because it happened last year, too, to where it was a separate project that is not a DC thing that is not a Marvel thing. It's a Warner Brothers thing. Last year it was Kong Skull Island. I freaking loved that first trailer that came out. And to hear all the stuff like it's set in the 70s and to see all that was amazing. And immediately, again, kind of like Spider-Man this year, got me out of that King Kong fatigue that I'd kind of been through and made me say, I'm finally excited again to see a King Kong movie. Ready, player, one. Yes, this was awesome. First of all, it's a Spielberg film, and Spielberg rarely goes to Comic-Con or does anything like that, any conventions like that. So it was cool to see all the stuff he did and his answer for why he made the film. I didn't want anybody else to fuck it up. Great answer. I'm, I, oh man, I wish I would have been in the room for that. But the trailer freaking blew my mind because I had no idea what to expect. I haven't read the book or anything. You know, really didn't know too much going into it. But to see what they were going for with this looked freaking fantastic and it really bumped up because it was something i would probably have seen anyways but now it's like top of the list of can't wait to see stuff i mean it looks incredible with all the stuff of the cg all looks good so far i mean just the trailer the way they paired the pure imagination from willy wonka mixed in with all these great images and things i thought i would never see even in my wildest nightmares i thought i never thought i would see the iron giant Blowing away Freddy Krueger with a giant gun. <laughs> Holy shit! Oh, that was awesome. And then plus to see the DeLorean. You know, I've never seen any of the Back to the Future movies on the big screen. I'm not lucky enough to be somebody who can say that. But to be able to see the DeLorean on the big screen, that's going to be a great thing. And yeah, I mean, there's, I'm sure there's all sorts of other surprises and little Easter eggs and things that they didn't show yet. But this has made me ecstatic to see what comes next. I'm sure we'll get another trailer probably in time for Christmas or Thanksgiving or something. I don't know what else they could pull out of their sleeves and give me that would make me more excited, but... I think, I get a feeling the next trailer is going to be even better. But they started out on a really high note on this. So that was really the thing that got me pumped. And I was like, all right. The thing was, I wasn't really digging Comic-Con so far until they dropped that on Saturday afternoon. And I was like, finally, I was like, something I can see and really get excited for. Even if it was something I had read about, I still would have been a little more anticipated of it. But to actually see that trailer and to see what they're going for, 
makes it look like what could be a really spectacular, fun film. And, you know, Steven Spielberg, especially lately, he's been doing all these kind of heavier drama films. Bridge of Spies was pretty hard drama. War Horse was pretty hard drama. Now to see him kind of break loose and have something fun like this come out, I think really excites me. <sighs> okay, well, that's all said and done. So yeah, Comic-Con, I think overall, we got some really good newsworthy events happening. Big headline things with Ben Affleck stuff. And some really exciting things that we didn't think were going to be all that exciting, like Ready Player One. So yeah, and of course the Marvel stuff, good too. So yeah, I think that's going to wrap it up. And yeah, so we'll see what happens this week. Usually the week after Comic-Con is pretty slow news-wise because all the stuff dropped over the weekend. There's a couple other movies I've seen recently, like Book of Henry and The Hero, which are kind of smaller films. I've done reviews for them online. I'd like to share with them here on the podcast, so I might get to those on Friday if I have time. Depends on what else is going on this week. All right, guys, so until next time, this has been the Plagman Rules Podcast.